Thank you, Jason, for joining us today. We're really grateful for your time. Um, really want to talk to you about your experience of all of these webinars you've given over the last year and how you found them and what's your learning from those. So I'm going to kick off with uh, my first question, which is how is giving a webinar different from giving a live conference keynote? Well, you don't get all the coffee and lunches and dinners around them, do you? You have to deal with that yourself. But fundamentally, I think the most important thing to remember is for the audience, it's maybe not as different as you think. For you, it's very different because you have to present in this slightly weird way with lack of feedback, with lack of whites of people's eyes and looking into a camera rather than looking at your screen. But the audience, if you think about where they're sitting, they are listening relatively passively, hopefully paying attention and not on their emails, although that is more likely, frankly, electronically than it is live. So you have to think of them as being there uh, and you have to perform, forgive the language, but you have to think about that performance being just as if you were on a stage, just as if you were doing your thing in a conference room, just you're not, you're sitting on an office chair in an environment that you know better than them. Okay, so that sounds good, except that because they're not sitting in front of you, then it must be a bit hard to tee yourself up for it. I mean, how, how would you prepare yourself for a webinar if you were gonna give, you know, you're giving your QI Connect to two and a half thousand people, how do you do the prep for that? I find chocolate and caffeine help, <laughs> helps me on that road, but no, to be to be serious, I think you do have to prepare in a similar way, it, it's not, It's not. you don't quite get the buzz of meeting the audience beforehand or being in the exhibition hall or chatting to your friends because you're at something you've been at a, a hundred times before. And I, I miss that, actually. I'm sure lots of people do. But you have to prep. You have to prepare. If you're telling a story for the first time, if you're using materials for the first time, you have to rehearse. Now, I, I genuinely do do that. I, I, I rehearse new stuff. Now, if I use things repeatedly, I'd, of course, I don't need to do as much of that. But when we introduce new story, new data, new versions of what we do, then I actually sit in front of the screen and I do it. And I try and do it with emotion, with smile or sadness or whatever the appropriate emotion is. And I, I think you should practice. I think you should actually rehearse. And I don't just mean the tech. You should definitely rehearse the tech because the tech can be confusing, it can be different, and you may not be quite as up to speed with it as you think you are, but you should also rehearse your actual performance. With the emotions and, and the facial gestures and that sort of thing as well. And that's really difficult because yeah. both in the rehearsal and in the live, you don't have the response. Unless you're using a, a slightly obscure version of social media, you're not going to get little love hearts coming up as you talk, much as I seek them. You're going to have to just presume you're funny. Now, that comes easy to some people because I presume I'm funny all the time. But uh, it, 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 on a serious level, feedback is harder to get. So you just have to presume that people are listening, presume people are engaged, and kind of kind of go for it is my, is my advice. So courage. Yeah, cur courage to... Be confident in your material, but also confidence in your presentation. So you've been invited to do this because you are engaging, because you are the expert in this thing, whatever this thing might be, be it pharmacy or person-centered care or whatever it happens to be. They've, they've chosen you to do this because you are the content expert yeah. and you should get that across to the crowd. I think you probably need to exaggerate it a little bit more digitally than you do if you're in a conference room. So you have to animate your face you have to animate your movement maybe a little bit more because you're just sitting in an office chair it's it's more like the big stage than the small intimate group talk that you might have given in smaller conference rooms it seems to me yeah no, that sounds good um and do you dress do you dress differently I have shorts on more often, if I'm honest. I, I, I dress my top half. Ah, I think it's too much information. It probably is too much information. I, I, I think you should probably dress and prepare more generally as if you're going to the conference. So, so there's something about, I remember a, a, a mentor of mine many, many years ago, before, and he's a fantastic presenter, would go into 
the bathroom of the conference centre or the hotel and kind of look at himself in the mirror and think, right, game face. And I always thought it was a bit stupid. Actually, it's not stupid. It's actually very clever because it, it, it gets you to click into something different, a, a, a presentation mode, let's call it. And if you wear a shirt and tie, if you wear a fancy top, then do do that. Then if that, if that helps you get into that mindset, then do it. We'll just not tell anybody you have sandals and shorts on underneath the desk. <laughs> Sounds good. I wear perfume when I'm presenting, which is there you are. So that's the, that's the same thing. So that's yeah. you preparing in the same way yeah. to to go to go. That's your game fix. Yeah. Um, and okay. So last question: um, audience feedback. So a lot of these live sessions have got chat that goes down the side. Um, do you, how, how, do you, how do you deal with chat and chatbots? Yeah, I think, this is, I think this is difficult. I, I think the, the, the technical way of dealing with it properly is to have somebody else looking at it and somebody else dealing with Q&A. And most, most organizations now do that very well and they feed them in. It's quite hard. <clears throat> it's quite hard to come in, do your talk and w- monitor that at the same time, unless you're in a really small group. The, these kinds of presentations, I think, need your full attention down the camera lens. Yeah. It, the, looking for how well you did is a different thing. And I think you need trusted peers for that. I think you need people to tell you the truth, not people who just will tell you you were wonderful. You need people to actually critique your presentation, be that family or, in my case, my mother sometimes, but also participants, people who will be able to tell you how it went. Social media does a bit of that, depending on who you are and what your following is on social media. But social media can be awfully, awfully biased in either direction, actually. You could you could lose your mind getting lost in some of the social media responses to your talk. So you have to be careful of it. But I think the best way of doing it is to have genuine critique from people who genuinely care about you and what you're saying. So those follow-up conversations that you and I have after you've done a presentation are, are completely are completely crucial and I can I can rely on you being honest. I can also rely on giving you some of the blame if it hasn't gone. <laughs> oh, that was a quid pro quo. Works both ways. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. That's brilliant. That's extremely helpful. And hopefully we'll give our viewers a bit of an insight into the life of Jason giving webinars and your expertise in that. So thank you very much. Thank you.